Scripture reading this morning is going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 17. And as you turn there, can we all please stand for the reading of God's Word? First Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephanas. Besides that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Our Father and our God, we ask for your blessing to be added to the reading of your word this morning. Help each one of us to have clarity on what it is that the Spirit of God is saying to us through this passage of Scripture. Pray that we would each apply it to our own lives and to our our church as well, uh, that we would stand united, united in the gospel, united in the calling that we all have as children of you. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. From the earliest days of Christianity, division has always been a problem in the church. Even in the Gospels, before the church had officially started, we find the apostles often bickering with one another, uh, having petty disagreements, arguing about which of them would be the greatest in Christ's kingdom. And Jesus anticipated that this problem of division would be pervasive amongst his followers. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for us, uh, for those who would follow him, and he prays these words, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given to me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Jesus prayed to his father that the church would be one, that we would be unified. He prayed that we would be so united as one body that we would reflect the unity that Jesus has with his own father. Yet today we see churches divided. Churches divide for all sorts of silly reasons. We divide ourselves racially. We have black churches. We have white churches. Sunday morning is, sadly, one of the most segregated hours of our week. We divide ourselves into groups by age. We have traditional churches where everything is old-fashioned, and thus the church ends up being filled with older people. On the other hand, we have more contemporary churches so fixated on appealing to younger people that they often end up sort of pushing out the older Christians among them. We also divide ourselves along preferential lines. We like things to be done a certain way in the church. We have certain preferences, certain things that are a big deal to us, and so we find a group that is doing every little thing just the way that we want it to be done. And all of this leads to the division that we see today. There are churches on every corner, each one tailored to the specific desires of a small group. Division has always been a problem, even in the very early days of Christianity. The church in Corinth was dividing for another reason. They were considering themselves followers of their preferred teachers. And this issue is so serious that despite all of the other problems that the church of Corinth had, and we'll get to many of those in the weeks and months to come, Paul addresses this one first. The issue of division is the one he begins with. And so that brings us to our text today, 1 Corinthians 
chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. Now, as I read through this text a moment ago, there are some basic ideas that I think are probably clear enough for everyone. Uh, The first time you read through it, you understand that the church in Corinth was dividing in silly ways, ways that were distracting. And Paul is urging them to knock it off, to be united. Paul doesn't want these Corinthians to be so fixated on any human teachers uh, that they've had in the past, including himself. Uh, Those kind of basic points seem to be very clear from the text. But there's also some questions that came to my mind as I first considered this passage, and perhaps a few of these are questions that you're wondering as well. For example, is Paul really expecting the church in Corinth to have total uniformity of opinion on everything? What does he mean in verse 10 by urging them to be of the same mind and judgment? Are they all supposed to think the same way? Next question, are there no good reasons for Christians to divide? For example, what about doctrinal matters? Are we supposed to just ignore those differences for the sake of unity? In verse 12, Paul mentions that there are some in the church of Corinth who are saying that they are followers of Christ. Are they right? If they are, why does it seem like Paul is rebuking them? Don't they have the right idea that we are supposed to be followers of Christ? Another question, what's going on in verse 16? You notice there, Paul seems to have forgotten people that he baptized. Uh, Isn't he writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Because just reading verses 14 to 16, it kind of doesn't seem like it. It seems like he's just a guy having trouble remembering things and kind of writing down as he goes. In verse 17, why does Paul say that Christ didn't send him to baptize, but only to preach the gospel? Isn't baptism a big part of what we are, in fact, sent out to do? Didn't Jesus say, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Lastly, what does Paul mean about eloquence and wisdom in verse 17 robbing the gospel of its power. We just finished up a study of the book of Proverbs, and I kind of got the idea that wisdom was a good thing. Here, Paul seems to be saying that wisdom and eloquence is detrimental to the preaching of the gospel of Christ, that it robs the gospel of its power. So what is all that about? We're going to do our best to answer those questions as we work through the text this morning, beginning with verses 10 through 12. I want to just get a quick overview of these first three verses. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. First thing I want to point out in these verses is that this is really a master class in how to confront issues in the church. Notice Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He comes right out and confronts them with the issue at hand. Not only that, but Paul is not vague. He's very specific in addressing the issue. He doesn't just call them to be united as a church in general terms, No, Paul brings up the specific issues going on there. Notice verse 12 where he says, what I mean is this. He gets very particular. Not only that, he tells them exactly what he's heard, and he tells them who it is that told him about this. He pinpoints Chloe's people is where he's getting this information. We don't know who Chloe was or who her people were. Uh, Possibly means a family member. Possibly she was a woman of means. And so one of her servants was traveling from Corinth to Ephesus and brought Paul this report. But regardless, Paul wants the Corinthians to know exactly where he got his information. This is how Christians ought to settle issues in the church. We deal with things directly. We get together and figure things out. Don't sweep things under the rug. Don't just avoid things that are issues that are causing contention among the body No, we are to get on the same page with each other so that we can be united. It reminds me of Acts 15 when the church was divided about how to handle Gentiles who were coming to Christ. Do you remember in our study of Acts 
a couple of years ago that some of the church wanted the new Gentiles that were coming to Christ to be circumcised and to begin to follow the Old Testament law of the Jews. Others said that that wasn't necessary. And it would have been easy for the church at that point to just split in two. You have one side that, that believes one thing, one side that believes another, just form two separate churches. But that's not what they did. Instead, in a spirit of unity and Christian maturity, the two sides came together in Jerusalem and discussed the issue until they came to a consensus about how to move forward. And at the end of the chapter, we read that they were in one accord. Unity had been restored in the church because they came together and they dealt with their disagreement with a spirit of humility and submission to the Holy Spirit's leading. This is how Christians ought to settle issues that come up in the life of the church. Now, let's get back to our text. Verse 10, notice how Paul begins. I appeal to you, brothers. Paul urges them. He exhorts them. He appeals to them. Parakaleo, meaning to come alongside. And he does this by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning Paul is not merely giving them his opinion on the issue. He is reminding them that he is an apostle of Christ. And so he is speaking authoritatively in his role as an apostle. This statement, I appeal to you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a reminder to them of his apostolic authority to speak to this issue. And then here's what he says. All of you agree. Have no divisions among you. No schismata, where we get the word schisms. This issue of division in the church is going to be the subject of Paul's writing from here until the beginning of chapter 5. On Wednesday night, we kind of did an overview of 1 Corinthians uh, seeing how the first six chapters primarily are dealing with reports that Paul has heard about issues going on in the life of the church. And then chapter 7 to 16 are dealing with the things they wrote to him, uh, questions that they had. Here, this issue of division is going to be covered from chapter 1 to the end of chapter 4. And all within those chapters, Paul is urging them to be united, to stop quarreling, stop dividing into groups within the church. And he presents several arguments for why they should be united. But this 10th verse is important for setting the stage for the rest of what's going to come in the next few chapters. Paul's intent in all of this is for the unity of the church. Notice the depth of the unity that Paul wants them to have. He doesn't just tell them to stop fighting. He doesn't just tell them, keep quiet about your disagreements, stop making a big deal about it. No, Paul tells them, be united in the same mind, in the same judgment, or you could say opinion, meaning they are to actually agree. A lot of us would read through this text and miss that point. We would think that Paul is merely telling them, keep your differences to yourselves, uh, don't make a big deal about it. But lo Paul longs for them to experience true unity of mind. He wants them to actually agree, not just pretend to agree for the sake of peace. He wants them to come to a place where they are all on the same page, presenting a united voice to the city of Corinth. Now, before we proceed any further, I want to address three false kinds of unity. The first is a unity that tolerates sin. The second is a unity that minimizes doctrine. And the third is a unity that demands total uniformity, even on gray areas. We're going to take each one of those one at a time. And the reason for this little interruption in our exposition of the text is to clarify what Paul is not talking about. For each of these three kinds of false unity, we're going to stay right here in 1 Corinthians and demonstrate that Paul is not arguing for any of these. First, in urging the Corinthian church towards unity, Paul is not meaning that they should tolerate sin in the church for the sake of unity. That's a false kind of unity that says, basically, for the sake of all of us getting along, we're going to minimize the importance of holiness and separation in the church. Now, we know that Paul isn't saying this because later in the letter, Paul goes as far as to tell them to kick someone out of their church. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. 
the entire fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul is urging the church to kick this member, this sinning member, out of their assembly. He is corrupting their witness as a church. He is a blot on their testimony. And lest you think that for the sake of unity, we should just ignore the issue, that is not what Paul says. Verse 13 of the same chapter, he concludes with these words, purge the evil person from among you. Paul is not telling them to tolerate open and flagrant sin in the church for the sake of maintaining a fake kind of unity. Secondly, Paul doesn't want the church to adopt a kind of unity that minimizes doctrine. Uh, the issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is not a doctrinal divide in Corinth. It's important that you understand that. Uh, Paul and Apollos and Cephas, they're all on the same page doctrinally. They had the same theology. They were teaching the same message. Paul mentions Peter's preaching in chapter 15, along with himself and others. And toward the end of the letter, Paul says that he actually encouraged Apollos to go back to Corinth in the future. Paul emphasized in chapter 3 of this letter that he and Apollos were united together as co-workers in Corinth, that God had used both of them to build up the church. So there was no issue between them. We do know of at least one doctrinal dispute that was going on in Corinth, and Paul brings that up in chapter 15. Verse 12 of the chapter, he says, If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? So there were some in the church of Corinth that were claiming that there was no resurrection of the dead. This was a doctrinal disagreement. And Paul doesn't sweep this under the rug for the sake of unity. There is no unity without a mutual commitment to the truth. And so Paul writes this 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the largest chapter of the letter, to correct this false teaching that had crept into the church at Corinth. So when we talk about pursuing unity, we are not talking about a unity that minimizes doctrinal truth. As Paul says in Romans 16, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. So when it comes to doctrine, someone is teaching something that contradicts the doctrine of Scripture, Paul says, separate from them. So in other words, unity at all costs is not what Paul is advocating for here. There are issues, there are times when we are to separate from others. And a major doctrinal issue would be one such issue. Thirdly, when Paul is speaking of unity and calling them to be united, to have the same mind, he is not talking about total uniformity on every issue in church life. It'd be easy to read 1 Corinthians 1.10 and assume Paul wants everyone to agree on everything. But as you keep reading the letter, you get to chapters 8 through 10, which deal with the issue of whether or not Christians should eat meat that was previously offered to idols. We're not going to go through all of that right now. We'll get to that later. But Paul acknowledges throughout those chapters that some people in the church felt total freedom uh, to eat this meat. They considered it irrelevant. There's no such thing as idols. It's false uh, worship of something that doesn't even exist. Therefore, the meat is fine. Others in the church felt that the meat was tainted, having been associated with idolatry. Thus, their conscience would not allow them to eat it. And Paul doesn't try to get everyone to have the same opinion. He doesn't try to force uniformity of thought on everyone in this gray area. Rather, he urges them all to maintain a spirit of unity and respectfulness toward one another, even where they may have differences of opinion. So as we go back to our text, just remember Paul's not talking about doctrinal issues where scripture is clear, and he's not talking about sin being tolerated for the sake of unity, nor is he demanding total uniformity of thought on everything. What Paul is addressing in this first chapter is petty disagreements, quarreling, groups within the church thinking that they are better than others, and specifically people aligning themselves with human teachers more than recognizing their unity as followers of Christ. We pick it back up in verse 11. He says, It has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, 
or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Now, Paul was an apostle. He was also the founder of this church in Corinth. And as we read in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul performed many miracles while he was there in Corinth. So, it's not surprising that someone like Paul would have left quite an impression on the people there. I mean, can you imagine having an apostle in your midst, performing miracles, starting your church, Uh, And so some people were quite tied to Paul as a person. They became quite proud of their association with Paul. They considered themselves special because they were saved under Paul's ministry. After Paul left, Apollos comes on the scene in Corinth. We know from Acts 18 that Apollos was an eloquent speaker. He was schooled in Alexandria, Egypt, which was the educational center of the ancient world. This would be sort of like having a doctorate from Oxford or something. And so he too had great influence in the Corinthian church as a gifted teacher and preacher of God's word. And so while some in the church were proud of their association with Paul, the apostle, the founder of their church, others now consider themselves primarily followers of Apollos, seemingly impressed with his gifts, his teaching abilities, his rhetoric. Then the third group were those who followed Cephas. Cephas is just another, it's the Aramaic version of the name Peter. Peter was, after all, one who knew Christ perhaps better than anyone else. He had spent years in his presence. Jesus had said in Matthew 16 that he was going to build his church on Peter. Therefore, some had elevated Peter in their minds, sort of in a similar way to how the Roman Catholic Church today looks to Peter as the first pope, sort of the foundation of of the early church. And by the way, this passage is quite a good one to address that very issue. Now, what about that last group? Here's where things get a little bit more tricky, because they say, not I follow Apollos, or I follow Paul, or I follow Peter. No, they say, I follow Christ. Now, this group has been interpreted in a few different ways. It seems at first, well, maybe they were right. Maybe they were saying the right thing, but then it's odd that Paul would list them alongside the other factions in the church. It's possible that this group was a sort of fake spiritual smugness. You could certainly read it that way. Uh, You can imagine some people saying, well, I I, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and then there's those pious people, well, I follow Christ, and they're sort of looking down on all the other groups. Or I think this is probably the most likely explanation It may be that this group was saying they only follow Christ and they reject human teachers. So while one group was committed to Peter, another group was following Paul, this group didn't really listen to Peter or Paul. This is sort of like today the red-letter Christians, maybe you've heard of them, uh, basically minimizing all of Scripture except for the things that Jesus specifically said. And they honestly think that that's a good attitude to have. But Jesus is the one who affirmed the authority of the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus is the one who commissioned his 12 apostles and gave them authority to speak on his behalf. And so, in fact, while many even today think themselves to be super spiritual for rejecting human teachers and leaders in favor of Jesus only, they are in fact disobeying Jesus' words. A slightly less extreme version of this same errant mindset that exists today are those who may read the Bible for themselves, but they have no interest in the church or anyone teaching them. They want to be self-taught. And while this attitude may have the veneer of piety, again, at its root, it is pride. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4 that God is the one who gave to the church apostles and prophets evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In other words, Paul is saying in these verses, that God gave us human teachers to learn from. They are gifts from God. He doesn't want us figuring things out on our own. Rather, he gave us leaders and teachers to build us up, to help us mature spiritually, and to protect us from false doctrine that could deceive us. And so we ought to be thankful 
for the teachers God has raised up in the church and learn from them rather than rejecting them out of a misguided notion of following only Jesus. By the way, lest you think I'm being entirely self-serving here, uh, this goes for pastors too. We ought to learn from and listen to other teachers. Peter had some things to learn from Paul in Galatians chapter 1. Apollos had some things to learn from Aquila and Priscilla in Acts 18. And so regardless of who you are or how much you think you know, all of us have things to learn from others. And so we ought to give thanks for teachers that God has given to the church. Now, with that being said, back to our text, let's balance this out, because most of those in Corinth didn't have this problem of underemphasizing the value of human teachers. Rather, it seems that most of them were idolizing their human teachers. And so Paul says to them in response, verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Paul is thankful, he says, that he didn't baptize many of them because his goal wasn't to build a personal following. It seems that some in this church were finding significance in the fact that they were baptized by Paul, the apostle, to which Paul says, it doesn't matter who, who baptized you. It matters whose name you were baptized into. To whom were you pledging allegiance when you were baptized? Paul? Of course not. They were baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Paul and Apollos were nothing. They were human instruments used to bring them to Christ. Christ is the head of the church, not Paul. And so by emphasizing who it was that had baptized them, they had been missing the whole point of baptism. As Paul goes on to say in chapter 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The very baptism that was meant to bring them together as one body in Christ was now being used as a means of dividing them. Then verse 16 of our text, Paul makes this little note. I did baptize also the household of Stephanos. Besides that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Now, we'll probably talk about this more on Wednesday night, but this is one of those verses that's a real problem for you if you think that the Bible was dictated word for word from God to the human writers. Uh, we've talked about this issue of inspiration before, but the important thing to recognize, especially when we're talking about the New Testament letters, is that they are written with apostolic authority. When we read 1 Corinthians, we ought to receive it as the word of God because it was written by an official spokesman for Christ, an apostle that Christ had revealed things to and spoken to and commissioned to have authority over his church. But that doesn't mean that Paul was writing these letters in some kind of a trance with his eyes rolled in the back of his head and you know, the Holy Spirit was like whispering to him word for word as he was writing. If that's what inspiration meant, we wouldn't expect to find Paul forgetting as he's writing about somebody that he baptized. Again, we'll probably talk more about that on Wednesday night. Verse 17, Paul concludes this section with these words. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Paul is not minimizing baptism here. Rather, he is emphasizing the gospel. He's saying to these Corinthians, the fact that Paul baptized you is irrelevant. Their fascination with his baptism was missing the point of his whole ministry which was a proclamation of the good news of salvation in Christ. Now, we're going to get more into this next week, but when we try to be eloquent and wise and impressive to the world, we rob the gospel of its power because it distracts from, from the simplicity of the good news. It focuses attention on the preacher rather than the message that we preach. It makes people impressed with the speech rather than convicted by the substance. And that's what was happening here in Corinth. The church at Corinth was all about eloquence and wisdom. 
And so they were so fixated on people like Paul or Apollos or Peter. They preferred one human teacher over another because of these superficial differences in style or speech. And in so doing, they missed the central message that Paul, Apollos, and Peter all agreed on. They were getting caught up in Apollos' eloquence, Paul's miracles, and in so doing, they were de-emphasizing the gospel. They were getting caught up in who the human instrument was that brought them to Christ to such an extent that they were missing the unity they all had in Christ. In other words, they were so focused on the style of the messenger that they de-emphasized the substance of the message. Again, we're going to come back to that next week in verse 17, because really a transition statement to the rest of uh, the next section, which focuses on eloquence and wisdom being at odds with the power of the gospel. As we close this morning, here are just six concluding principles from this text. If you want to get kind of the main takeaways from the passage, here they are. Number one, deal with issues directly. One of the best ways to fight division in the church is to deal with issues head on, quickly, directly. If you have an issue with a person in the church, as Matthew 18 tells us, go to them, talk to them one-on-one, try to work it out. Be specific and straightforward. Unity is not found in sweeping things under the rug or in offering vague statements. No, unity is found in dealing with problems straightforwardly and directly in the church. Secondly, We learn from this passage that human teachers are gifts from God, and that will be expounded more in the chapters to come. Paul tells this church that they were blessed to have teachers like himself and like Apollos, and that they should learn from them and be thankful for them. We should never have this attitude of, well, I only follow Jesus, I don't need to listen to anybody else or learn from anyone else. That is an attitude of pride. Third, We should never be 100% committed to any man. If the leader of your church is not able to be questioned, you aren't in a church, you're in a cult. If you hear me say something in a sermon that you don't see taught in Scripture, I invite you. uh, Bring it up during our Wednesday night Bible study, and that has happened many times before. And uh, usually we have a very good conversation about it. And at the end of it, if you still think that I'm saying something that doesn't square with Scripture, then forget what I said and stick with the Bible. You should never be 100% committed to any man. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In other words, follow human leaders, but only insofar as they are following Christ, which leads us to the next principle. Don't forget to whom you owe ultimate allegiance. So appreciate human teachers and leaders in your life, but don't put them on such a pedestal that they become Lord of your life. You weren't baptized into the name of Paul. Paul wasn't crucified for you. Remember that Jesus is your Lord. Next, unity comes through a mutual submission to the Lord. The unity that Paul is urging the church of Corinth toward is only possible if everyone is submitted to the same Lord. Paul appeals to them by the name of Christ, assuming that all of them would understand the authority that Christ had over them. And that recognition is key to a unified church. We must understand that Christ is the head of the church. Whatever he says is what we are to do. And there may be some times that Scripture doesn't tell us specifically one way or another on a certain issue, and we may be free to come to different conclusions on those matters. But on everything where Scripture speaks plainly, we have a responsibility to submit to the word of the Lord to us. And that submission across the church brings unity. It solves a lot of disputes. Lastly, we learn from this passage to recognize the partnership we have with brothers in Christ, even those who may be different than us. You were saved under Paul's ministry? Cool. You were saved under Apollos? Who cares? (laughs) We're all brothers in the Lord. You eat meat offered to idols and I don't? Paul says we're still brothers in the Lord. Despite our differences, you are just as much a child of God as I am. 
I'm no better than you, and I should never start to think of myself as better than anyone else in Christ's kingdom. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, Paul says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Meaning, the things that formerly divided us, things like our race, our status, those things shouldn't matter in the church. We are all united in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1.27, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. We ought to recognize the unity of the body of Christ, even in churches that do things differently than we do. If we agree on the gospel and the core doctrines of Christianity, we should recognize our unity as brothers in the Lord. Remember how Paul began this letter to Corinth, addressing them as those who have been called to be holy along with all those who in every place call on the name of Christ, both their Lord and ours. We are no better than any other group who are seeking to follow Christ. And so we ought to be united as one body. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power.